So having uh, said that, I'm going to turn right away to uh, Mr. Cullen. Uh, I hope we can hear you correctly. Uh, please uh, go, go ahead. Hi, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we are hearing you very well. Perfect. Thank you so much for, for your kind invitation this, this second year. Uh, and let me uh, try to present where we are and what are the major challenges that we will have in the future and where we need to, to focus uh, enormously. So let me start by, by saying that relative to last year, the news are not uh, what we would have liked to be, meaning that the level of chronic undernourishment in the world remain very high to levels of 735 million people chronically undernourished. And if we project that to 2030, we will be around 590 million people chronically undernourished. Now, if we take out the effect of COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine, we are talking of levels uh, of around uh, 400 or 500, 400, uh, 119 million people less chronic undernourished. If you can pass the slide to the third one, please. You, next. That one. Okay, so basically what this graph is showing, what I was referring is 735 million people chronically undernourished projected to around 600 million by 2030. And there you see the effect of the COVID-19 and, and the war in Ukraine. Next, please. Now, also, if we look at the latest report that we just launched today, and we look at the new hotspots, we see that the situation is not improving at all. Uh, and basically what we are observing is that there is 18 hunger new hotspots comparing to 22 countries comprising 22 countries and 22 and uh, 22 countries and territories. So this puts in a situation where we have countries which are in a very severe situation, a situation which is uh, worse uh, than what we had uh, before, and especially now with the latest events, we have increased those. Uh, now, if we go to the next slide, uh, what is important to, to mention here is that this agri-food system is going into significant problems of risk and uncertainties. And that's what will drive the future of what we are observing. These uh, risk and uncertainties are not only on the humanitarian side, but are also on the macroeconomic side. More than 61 countries in debt distress, problems of exchange rate because of the interest rate increase, and significant linkages of the energy sector with biofuels, but also with fertilizers. And of course, the problem of contamination of land and destruction of land. All that affects directly the agricultural sector through inputs, through trade, logistics, which affects overall production, and that will affect, of course, the prices. And in addition, we have debt stress. But the challenge is that all this is under a lot of stress of water and climate change. And climate change will affect in four dimensions, will affect on extreme temperatures, excess of water, lack of water, variability of the climate indicators, which make more difficult for farmers to make decisions, but also pest and diseases evolution because of climate change. Next, please. Now, in this context of risk and uncertainties, we know that we have passed by now six of the nine planetary boundaries. And what that means, if we move to the next slide, it means that we are moving into something that we don't know. It means that we are moving into biophysical dynamics that are nonlinear and could be exponential. So the frequency of these events could significantly increase over time, and that's something that we need to carefully look at. Because what will happen is what we are observing today in Spain, for example, that the payments to the insurance has doubled or tripled because of the frequency of the weather events. So that is the environment we will be facing. Now, if we go to the next slide, there are four key drivers or transformation drivers that I want to raise uh, pretty briefly. First, the urbanization which will continue and it will continue in space. Second, industrialization. Third, the importance of carbon neutralization, as you were mentioning. Our belief is that we need good food for today and for tomorrow. And that what means is not only to produce more, more efficiently today with less, but also to be able to make it more sustainable. And that is what brings climate investment towards the agri-food system rather than the reverse, because the agri-food system has enough, of, enough space to improve substantially and have the major marginal returns in terms of reduction of emissions. 
And the fourth is digitalization. But let me touch on the first three of those. If we go to the next slide. In this figure, what we see is how urbanization uh, and how is the relationship between urbanization and the share of urban population, total population, and the share of agriculture, including fisheries and fishing, in total gross domestic product. At the global level, the share of urban population grew from 37% in 1970s to 56% in 2019, while the share of agricultural GDP decreased from 5.3% to 4.2%. And this is substantial, the change that we are observing at the global level. You can see the same in the high-income countries, and then you see in China the big difference of what we are observing uh, today. Now, if we go to the next slide, we also see that the, pro the projection of the population is projected to evolve uh, in the world and high-income countries and China. And in high-income countries, a clear stabilization of population is shown, and even a reduction in the case of China. But this is not what we are observing in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where we are observing a significant increase of the rural population still, and yet not converging like what we are observing in the case of, of China. So this means that urbanization will be a significant challenge, and that's something that we need to look carefully because the demand of the commodities that we will be eating will be varying accordingly. If we go to the next slide. Here, I approximate the industrialization by using the share of agricultural value added in GDP and the share of agricultural employment. As we can see, depending on the region, we can observe different dynamics. And while in the last 30 years, proportionally labor has left the agricultural sector for manufacturing and services, almost everywhere in low-income countries, labor productivity in these sectors has remained almost constant, while it expanded during the structural transformation in high-income countries. Indeed, labor productivity in the rest of the economy has almost stagnated in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, East Asia and the Pacific, while it has barely increased in South Asia and Near East and North Africa. So this shows something extremely important, which is also linked to the informality of these regions and how industrialization will evolve. Now, if we go to the next slide, we will see that the agri-food systems also creates pressures on our environment. And that's something that we need to look carefully. It creates effects because of emissions, 31%, biodiversity loss, water scarcity and pollution. And those are the externalities. But again, what I am saying is that we need to find a solution to these problems because we need to have good food for today and tomorrow. And if we just focus on the greenhouse gas emissions and climate change in the next slide, we will see that 31% of the global emissions, nearly 50% were from non-CO2 gases and generated within the farm by crop and livestock production activities, 20% by land use, change processes, and mainly deforestation, peatland degradation, and 30% by supply chain. So that's the distribution. So there is enormous potential for carbon neutralization. If we go to the next slide, we will see here that our agri-food systems needs to be transformed to achieve this carbon neutralization. And for this, we need to improve governance of natural resources, improve productivity, this means produce more with less, improve production practices, improve consumption patterns and behavior, and use a cleaner energy. So our work here, and in the figure, what you show in the red bubbles is the size of the problem, and in green bubbles, the size of potential sequestration. So there is enormous potential uh, on the bigger problems in the use of energy, in the livestock use, in manure management, in fertilizers and rice to create reduction. And there is enormous potential in land use and forest peatland, but also in soil management to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. That's why I was saying that the agri-food system could be an opportunity to accelerate this process while at the same time assuring that we produce what we need for today and for tomorrow. And finally, my last slide is just to, to focus about uh, what we can do and, and where we can make a, a difference in this process. And here is where we need to tackle at the same time the emergency situations with an integrated humanitarian peace building policies, but also we need to protect our, house, our households increasing resilience and scaling up climate resilience across agri-food systems. That's the only way we will be able to address the challenges of water and climate, and the only way we can contribute to the bigger access of healthy diets, because today 3.1 billion people don't have access to healthy diets. But on the financing part, there are several boxes that we need to look. One is support agriculture and how we can repurpose that, how we can accelerate and promote better incentives of the use of that support to agriculture, and that's the repurposing agenda. The second one is, of course, 
out of the public sector, but it's the private sector, the international financial organizations, and the other traditional donors. So that's the way we need to allocate resources in the proper incentives. Next week, on the 6th, we are launching the first issue of the True Cost Accounting of Food, which will bring a lot of insights and information of where these incentives should be aligned to minimize externalities from agriculture towards this idea of good food for today and for tomorrow. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Cullen, for providing this uh, broad vision uh, and concluding, especially on the uh, policy directions that we have to, to take. Uh, one point that uh, I also take from your last slide is that you are using several times the word healthy diets, which means also something that I did not say in my own introduction, that agriculture is also part of our health agenda and uh, which includes also uh, changes in the way we produce food, but also in what type of food we eat and how we consume it. So thanks so much for providing this big picture.